everyone. Um, oh, so we're live now, huh? We, we, we are live now. Um, okay, okay. <laughs> I'm ready. Um, I, I think for today, so I have a few questions. I received a few questions. By the way, there will be a lot of sound because Spain uh, just lost in the World Cup to uh, Morocco. And uh, the area where I live has a lot of Spanish and Moroccan people as well. So somebody will be very devastated and somebody uh -oh. will be extremely, extremely happy. Uh, oh, wait a minute. So where, is the game going on right now? No, it finished uh, a few minutes ago. Um, oh, oh, wait, and Spain lost. Yeah, extra time and penalties, everything. Oh, my goodness. Okay. Um, so uh, to give you some time to um, look up the file that we wanted to discuss last, uh, uh, last week, I'll, I have some questions. I'll just circle through the questions and uh, jump in at any stage uh, that you like. So everyone, uh, thanks for joining us again. This is our weekly Chance Talk uh, webcast. We have been doing a lot of these over the last few months. All of them, all of the recordings are available on the Risk Academy YouTube channel and uh, will eventually be available on the Chance Talk website. Um, so you can always go back and recap on what we uh, discussed because Sam, every, every single week, Sam would give um, a very nice case study demonstrating some of the important uh, points in risk management. Um, so since, the la since last week, I received a number of questions and I, I think we can kind of start by going through them uh, pr relatively uh, quickly because the, there are quite, quite a lot. Um, the first question is, how can risk management improve the effectiveness of the organization? And um, I'll quickly share my experience and then some yeah. you know, jump in at any stage. Um, what, what I found is that risk management is not a, um, a single organism. It's not, it's not kind of, it's not a one thing that you do and it changes everything in the organization. Risk management in my experience is like million small uh, small things. So for example, we use risk analysis and insurance to optimize our insurance coverage, significantly improve the quality, saved millions of dollars on premiums. Then we used risk analysis in procurement and uh, changed the uh, model that the procurement team was using for vendor accreditation and vendor selection for tenders, vendor invitation for tenders. Uh, that significantly reduced the credit risk and the performance risk that the company was facing. So less delays, less uh, issues with quality, um, less uh, fines and issues with potential uh, potential sanctions. Uh, then we looked at the into investment decisions. And uh, uh, whenever we were buying a, a business or whenever we were constructing a new plant, chemical plant somewhere, risk analysis played quite a significant role because it allowed us to stress test assumptions and give the board members additional comfort that we've kind of, we analyzed the um, proposal, the, the, the project proposal from different angles and it continues to kind of stay strong um, no matter how the internal or external assumptions um, assumptions change. So it's, it's, uh, it passed the stress test. Uh, and then we've kind of, we changed bits and pieces in different processes throughout the organization. Um, we did some risk and some, some sensitivity models for the investor relationship team. So they could present it to the investment banks as uh, part of their um, bank communication. We um, uh, used risk analysis to help the HEC team justify the need for additional water purification plants because we showed that the uh, environmental risk exposure that the company was sitting on was significantly larger than the cost involved in uh, constructing the water purification plants. And then that mitigation would reduce the, the, the risk exposure quite dramatically. Um, so in my experience, uh, all those kind of pinpoint applications of risk analysis um, are the examples of how the value is, is, is generated uh, for, for the company. Uh, what, what, what was your experience, Sam? So let, 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 me, let me pose it a little differently. A 
I don't want to talk about risk analysis. I want to talk about chance awareness. Yep. Remember, Good. risk is a loaded word. Just risk is in the eye of the beholder. For the for the one thousandth time, is there a risk that IBM stock will go down tomorrow? No, I've shorted IBM. The risk for me is it goes up. Risk by itself is a meaningless word. Okay. The way I phrased it the other day. If an airplane flies over a forest and drops a pair of dice into the forest and they land on the forest floor and there's no one there to see it, is there uncertainty? Yes. We don't know which way the dice will go up. Is there risk? No. <laughs> will they make a sound? Yes. <laughs> Okay, so I, I'd like to take that question. The question was, how does risk analysis aid the organization? Was, was that it, it more or less? In, in, improves the effectiveness of the organization. How does risk uh, management improve the effectiveness of the organization? Let me ask a broader question. How does arithmetic improve the uh, organization? Can you imagine life without arithmetic? I'll tell you what we're actually selling here is not risk management. We're selling the arithmetic of uncertainty. So it applies anywhere there's uncertainty, which means everywhere, by the way, mm -hmm. <laughs> down to the electrons in your room, according to Heisenberg, you know. So it's much broader been putting the word risk around it. And um, in fact, it's a topic I do plan uh, to, to cover to cover today. And um, because really, one of the things I want to get to, and let's go through the rest of the questions, is sort of how you can get people to adopt this stuff, the whole changing of technology, adopting new technologies, evolution of technologies, and what we're even going to call it. Um, so instead of using the word risk management, I think I would like to use chance informed decisions. And they do not going calling something risk management. Um, it's see, it's really risk and reward management always. Yeah, and like one is. of the things I have heard back from numerous people um, is that by I mean, in corporate settings, is by the time you're managing the risk by itself, it's too late. Wait a minute. <laughs> you should have done this when you took the risk on and ask whether the reward was sufficient to accept that risk. <laughs> That's yeah. like happening up the food chain a bit than where you are now, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. You, I think you're actually answering one of the other questions because the question is when risk assessment should be carried out. And you, you I think you're completely spot on. The, you should well, think about easy. risk the before. Is, yeah. The answer is continually. <laughs> and, and and more importantly, before taking on the risk. Well, absolutely. <laughs> which which is a, which is a huge paradox because in corporate risk management, um, in this you know, enterprise risk um, world, it is common to do risk assessments on the schedule as in like you would do it quarterly or monthly or annually, which in my mind always was so weird because you do risk assessment before you have to make an important decision. So your decision is chance informed. Otherwise, what's the point? And when you kind of made all the decisions and it suddenly is, you know, is that day of the year when you have to do the risk assessment kind of defines the purpose, doesn't it? Defines what? Uh, the purpose. Right, right. Um, yeah, so, uh, again, I try not to use the word risk at all. There's a lot of uncertainty. Good things can happen to you and bad things can happen to you. Um, and, uh, and it requires an awareness that is mostly not there. It, it, more it's, more it's, questions? It, it, sure. It, it almost like 
the you know this finding the kind of the right balance of risk reward you know taking taking the right amount of uh, of risks for the for the reward no that is alex that is exactly right as i'm going to show on one of my slides coming up it really starts with harry markowitz and the efficient frontier in finance which maybe we should in a sense start with once we launch into this program i mean once we get the questions out of the way uh, i have an interesting question and by the way we are live guys so ask the, uh, ask your questions in the comments um i, I love this question uh, what are the disadvantages of risk management yeah well i mean that the question is is anyone doing it right real risk management um so again i think it's the pro the problem is putting that name on it mm -hmm. what what is it let's go back to sort of like chance awareness okay i like chance awareness what is the disadvantage of chance awareness well if you're neurotic you might be worried about all these bad things that can happen to you and that might drive you nuts right so I mean, what is the what is the disadvantage of having it, of an ostrich pulling its head out of the sand and looking around? Right. Yeah, yeah. The, the I mean, it, it might drive the ostrich nuts. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, well, I actually, I think I actually came up with a with a good one because I, you know, I worked in in some countries with you know questionable governance practices. <laughs> and uh, I can tell you what the huge disadvantage of risk management is because it creates transparency. And there are executives who are scared of transparency because they want risks to be hidden from the shareholders, stakeholders, and the regulators. Um, so it, it's, it, and this is. Oh yeah, well, this is true everywhere. This is true in all countries, for gosh sake. Uh, yeah, yeah, and and uh, this brings me to another question that was asked um, just recently. Uh, it, somebody said, "Well, what if your executives are just not um, into, like, not absorbing, not accepting the quantitative kind of output of your quantitative risk analysis?" And my initial response was, I mean, see, see if you if you think differently. My initial response was, that's a really big red flag. If you bring somebody information, information that they didn't have that should, in all theory, improve the quality of decision making, and they block it or don't accept it with, without challenging the assumptions or the methodologies, they just kind of completely disregard it or ignore it. That's a big red flag because probably yeah. they have some alternative mo motive behind the decision. Listen, listen, listen. As usual, Alex, our conversations just, you know, don't stop here. You have now triggered a, a very important thought. Let's go back to the manager who does not want transparency. Okay. One of the original ideas behind probability management, which I must remind you, is storing uncertainty as auditable data that obeys both the laws of arithmetic and the laws of probability. One of the reasons for that is, oh, it, it's, a, it's a measure of uncertainty that is auditable, like in Paris at one point, they had a meter stick in a big gl glass case or something made of platinum. It's like, how long is a meter? We can't agree. Yeah, we can. Go to Paris. See how long that damn thing is. That's what a meter is, right? Very hard to sweep that under the rug when you've got these things out there as data. And let me keep going here. So I've been I've been working with uh, John Button of Gartner, who is I think one of our listeners, and and uh, and some and. Uh, Engwe Yo of, of Kaiser is doing mm -hmm. very cool stuff where he has developed and, and we're, what we're going to do is, is create the nonprofit. I'm going to tell you we're, we're not a profit making organization I'm going to tell you what we're going to do way in advance when we do it 
We may succeed. We may not. It may take us longer than we think. But this is the idea that, that sort of formulated with talking to John the other night. Um, let's take cyber risk losses. Like um, there's an email hack. Okay. Mm -hmm. What's the economic impact going to be? That's uncertain. Right. Well, we're going to capture the uncertainty as best we can. We're going to store it in a SIP. That means think about it in terms of a thousand or 10,000 Monte Carlo trials of what it could be, right? Then we're going to publish it on the web, completely open for everybody to see. Mm -hmm. Once it's there, it's very hard for that manager to say, well, it's uncertain. I can't estimate it. Oh, the, the length of the meter is uncertain. Oh, we sold you. We're selling you rope. Oh, we shortchanged you. Oh, you got you you got you got uh, 50 meters too little rope. Sure, but a meter is so poorly defined. How could you expect us to give? You? No, the meter is sitting in the museum in Paris. And you know what? You're supposed to sell us 300 meters of rope and i measured it with this thing and you sent us you know 250 meters of rope when you start getting those standards the managers can't use that excuse right yeah, and, absolutely. and there is an let's make sure we get through the rest of the questions here alex because i mean you know uh, th these are th that's it th these are all the interesting ones Okay, um, okay, okay. So if any more questions, write in the comments. Uh, but other than that, some. So, so I want to continue down the path you're on, by the way. And what I'd like to discuss today is the adoption of new technologies in general, because we have to understand that, you know, when Fibonacci brought Hindu Arabic numerals to Italy, people pushed back. <laughs> Like, it seems like a pretty good way to work, to, you know, Roman numerals, counting sticks, this junk. They even outlawed Hindu Arabic numerals in uh, Florence at one point. So there's lots of pushback. And I want to talk about that kind of pushback. But I, I want to go, I want to talk about this transparency issue of the economic impact of a, you know, an email hack is sitting out on the web. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, so John Button and I were talking the other night and we're thinking, um, oh my gosh, it's like, it's like Riskopedia. Yeah. And so I immediately thought, yeah. oh my God, got to run to GoDaddy and see if Riskopedia is available, right? <laughs> Was it? Yes, for $9,995 and I passed. Mm -hmm. Because as I'm running, John sends me a text. How about Chancepedia? Yep, bought it for 11 bucks. Nice. <laughs> oh, and also, also, uh, Wiki Chance. Okay. Wiki why, Chance is really cool. Why is Chance? Oh, oh, Chance Talk. Why, why was Chance Talk available? Man, I don't know. I am telling you, I have bought a lot of real estate in this area. Here, here's your hot tip. I mean, oh, it's the chance age, right? Mm -hmm. And I I know I've done my shtick on the chance age. Just a little reminder about the chance age. Um, we're redefining probability distribution for everyone, in case we have some new people. Probability distribution is now a nine-syllable term that induces post-traumatic statistics disorder or PTSD. You can use the word chance. And if you can estimate the chance that anything you're interested in is bigger or less than anything else you're interested in, you don't need no stinking probability distributions. But the ultimate definition of the chance age is, remember, the whole flaw of averages thing starts when the boss says, give me a number. What are our losses? Let's stick to risk management. What are our losses going to be this year, right? 
Oh, or usually, uh, how much how much budget how much budget we should allocate for mitigation or reducing? There the we risk? go. There we go. And that's a product <laughs> of the losses. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How much budget do we need to mitigation mitigate our losses? In the chance age, you say, how much do you want to budget? I'll tell you the chances you'll be covered. Yeah, yeah <laughs> it's yeah, so yeah. simple. But of course, you cannot do that with using probability. And that's got too many syllables. Okay, so we're going to use chance. And I will get into this a little more in a second. What, what, what I would like to do, if, if it's okay, Alex, I, I'd like to describe some other very obvious technologies mm -hmm. that were not adopted at first. And then I would like to propose how I think the stuff that you and I are from, and you and I and Doug Hubbard and Tom Keelan and let, let's go back to uh, Jacob Bernoulli 300 years ago <laughs> yeah. that this line of thought promotes. Um, I'd like to discuss how I think that is going to play out. But, but if I may, I'd like to start with a really obvious improved technology and how it was adopted, okay? So if I may, mm -hmm. a neighbor of mine years ago gave me a book called The Social History of the Machine Gun. What? He said, you know, this is a fascinating book. All right, I think on the cover of the book, Alex, why don't you Google that and see if you can find an image? <laughs> There was, oh my God, I mean, it's a grisly subject. There, somewhere, I think on the cover, there was a picture of a guy riding a camel with a machine gun mounted on it, all right? Anyway, so the, um, you, you, you should realize it, in, in the Civil War, they had things called Gatling guns which were not machine guns. You turned a crank and it fired one rifle after another. Now, mm -hmm. very brief aside, I have an 1898 Britannica, believe it or not. And I was looking up internal combustion engines. Ah, okay, there we are. Yes. I don't see the picture of the camel there, but some somewhere in, yeah, right. I had a different version and I think the camel was on the cover. There, there's a picture in there. Okay. Anyway, so... So I had this 1898 Britannica, and and um, in the article on internal combustion engines, it says, see also machine gun. What? A machine gun is actually an internal combustion engine with a lot of lead in the exhaust because the, the thing fires, the cartridge, the, the bullet is the piston, and the cartridge fires backwards and triggers the next cartridge to be loaded. Okay, anyway, the first real machine gun, where you just pull the trigger and it's just automatically driven by its own power, was created by a guy named Maxim. And in like, it was like 1895, he went to the US War Department and they, they put a target out on the field and they took 12 riflemen and 11 out of the 12 riflemen hit the target in the bullseye. And Maxim comes out with his Maxim gun and physically destroys the target. It's just like a bunch of splinters lying in the grass. And he says, I'll be rich. Not so fast. Not so fast. The army didn't know what to do with this thing. And in fact, at first they thought we wouldn't use these in any like regimented warfare. It, it, it turns out they did use them in the Boer War in, in Africa for slaughtering natives. Yeah, that's nice, but not in real warfare. Okay, then we get to World War I. And 20,000 British horses and men charge across the field and are annihilated by a German machine gun nest. Then the Germans counterattack with 20,000 horses and men and are annihilated by a British machine gun nest. At that point, the generals said, we get it now, we get it. We need lots more horses and men, that's what we need. <laughs> 
I'll Horrible. tell you who got it. Winston yeah. Churchill got it when he invented the tank. Do you know that Winston Churchill invented the tank? Anyway, all I'm saying is, if you wanted to kill people with rifles or machine guns, machine guns are so much better at killing people. Why did it take so long for them to figure it out, right? Sorry for that grisly example, but it's so obvious. What we are doing, <laughs> yeah, it's better at helping you understand uncertainty, but so what? So now I want to, I want to, describe what I think is a parallel evolution here. So one of the advantages of being really old is you can look back a long way and see how things changed. And I am old enough to remember before spreadsheets. First spreadsheet was VisiCalc, developed by VisiCorp, co-founded by Dan Feilstra. The spreadsheet itself was developed by Dan Bricklin, and I, I'm sorry, I'm blanking on his partner's name. And it it first appeared on the Apple II computer, which looked as just a dumb little piece of plastic with a dumb little square screen on the top that had like 40 characters going across. <laughs> Or maybe 20 lines going down. And yet it was interactive. I now call this limbic analytics. Now, this was at a time, so this was like 1978, 79 in there. They the typical computer center had a computer in it about as powerful as my Fitbit. <laughs> They build so they build like a like a twenty million dollar building around a Fitbit, <laughs> and, they, and they charge you a thousand dollars an hour to use it. And there was a huge infrastructure there, and you can imagine what those people thought about VisiCalc. <laughs> what a joke! That was like the Tyrannosauruses or whatever they were looking at the rats. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Who the hell cares about those things? So, of course, there was a struggle and there was evolution. And from VisiCalc, we had Lotus 1, 2, 3. And, well, of course, in those days, are you kidding, personal computers? You think grandmothers are going to learn how to use operating systems? Are you crazy? <laughs> right. That's like saying today. You think grandmothers could learn how to use internal combustion engines? Are you nuts? And by the way, the first internal, that's what you have in your car, if it isn't electric. Yeah. The first internal combustion engines had cylinders 20 feet across and were used for pumping out flooded mine shafts. You think a grandmother's going to, and how many grandmothers have mine shafts? So, <laughs> you know, this week's blog, by the way, is, is, is a quote from a guy whose name I forget. We shape our tools, then our tools shape us. We work our way in. And so the way the spreadsheet got in was on the periphery. It was absolutely seductive. Mm -hmm. Wow, it's interactive. Unbelievable. You can do limbic analytics. You, know, you change the number and the thing changes. And for me, because I, I started my career as an automobile mechanic. And I like to see things move around and figure out this is connected to that and that's connected to this. And um, so what we need to look for are places that are completely seductive. So let's take Chancepedia. I'm working hard on that. Mm -hmm. You'll be the first to know, Alex. And it'll be out there. And I mean, it, this was not possible a few years ago. And it is going to take advantage of the generalized metal log and the HDR generator and the SIPMAT3 standard 
And that fuddy-duddy that we were talking about who wants to hide the risk, <laughs> it's like, well, of course we didn't sell you enough rope. The meter is so poorly defined here, right? <laughs> no. <laughs> no. Go, you, you. By the way, I, I mean, I think it's grounds for being fired if you don't know about Chancepedia and go out there and check first, right? So, um, oh, and... And so I have a, um, I do have a little slide prepared here, actually. Um, any, any, you want to share. any comments, Alex, and, and any questions from the from the gallery? So, so first, uh, thanks, Andrew. Uh, Andrew is just making a point that um, it really is a failure of governance when some executives continuously reject um, a risk analysis. Thanks for the comments, Andrew. Yeah. Um, and by the way, so there is a, there was, after the 19, the, the, the 2007, 2008 financial crisis, there was an ex excellent article in the New York Times, uh, I think it was, by someone who talked about how did this slip through the risk management thing, right? And like the boards of directors, oh, we have a risk management department, check. We, oh no, we have a department of arithmetic, <laughs> check. Look, if you don't even, if you don't know arithmetic yourself, if you don't know the basic concepts of addition, multiplication, right? Subtraction, division. If you don't understand those things, I don't think you're qualified to be on the board of directors. And of course, you have to add to those what I call the five mindles of uncertainty as you do the arithmetic of uncertainty, right? And those are risk versus uncertainty, the concept of an uncertain number itself, what the heck is it? Diversification, Jensen's inequality, nonlinearities, which I call the flaw of averages and mm -hmm. interrelated uncertainties. If, if you don't get your mind around those yeah. as a board member, that's irresponsible. I, th I think for the next chance talk, we should probably spend a little bit of time on those five mindles. Well, I'm always glad to bring those up. I'm always glad to bring them up. Um, and um, well, while you're looking for the model, another horror I've story. Got, I've got, I'm ready to go. I'm, I'm going to share, share your share, share, you want to show me, okay? Yeah, yeah. Um, there was a story about John Harrison who created a navigation system in uk for uk government but because he was a clockmaker the jury um denied him the huge prize because they just could not accept that a kind of side discipline not uh from the um astronomy and mathematical uh, fields was able to deliver the the tool to to solve the problem so he, he's like, he's the, 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 the epitome of unlucky, uh, of uh, rejecting new, you know, new findings, new research, new sciences. Wait, 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 this, this is the guy who developed what? Uh, the, uh, I, I don't know what the English name, the navigate, something for the navigation. What, so the figure out the, or something? The, yeah, like this was like that like long that. time ago, what? Yes, it was back in 1707. Yeah, see, and I, I, I wonder if, because a huge part of uh, navigation is having decent clocks, right? Because, you know, the sun is moving around in the sky, both chronologically because the earth is rotating and also because you're going somewhere else. <laughs> so if you want to navigate off the sun and stars, you need to know where the earth is in its rotation, obviously. And of course, the, the time they use is Greenwich mean time because Greenwich was like English time, which is where all these navigators were coming from. So having a good clock is absolutely critical. Yeah. So, and okay. His, yeah. his findings were rejected. Just, just like the, the last, last quick story. In 1847, um, when Ignaz Semmelweis decisively proven that hand, hand washing for doctors, oh, God, yeah. cut, cut the incidents. 
uh, his findings were rejected, ignored. He was humiliated. It's, it's just, it's, it's a never yeah. ending story. Yes. He ended up, God, he ended up in a mental institution or something. Yeah. Oh my God. Yeah, I know. I know. Um, there are, there's so many examples of this, that the guy who invented continental drift, who, who realized it was continental drift. He was a geologist. Shamed, humiliated, whatever. Right. Um, yes. Okay. So, so I, I, I want to talk about how we are going to get this into organizations. And education is absolutely key. Education and not, oh, let me give you another wonderful example. Oh God, a wonderful example. Because I'm, we're gonna be talking about chantification and electrification, okay? So, you know, electrification replaces technologies using fossil fuels with those using electricity. And I've studied it quite a bit. It is so fascinating. Edison was really the first guy to push this. And in New York City, in New York City, shortly before, like maybe a decade before Edison wanted to wire the city for electric light, people had brought gas lighting into their houses. And to do that, all these buildings in New York had gas pipes running into them. And people are now saying, what? We just spent millions of dollars running gas pipes into our houses. Now you're gonna make us tear these out and put electric lines in? And Edison, that, hey, Wegner, that was the Continental Drift guy. That is absolutely right. Thank you, Andrew. And by the way, yeah. And I, I took a class once from, I think his nephew or something. <laughs> uh, anyway, so, uh, so that, that, that Fox Edison says, you know, we are going to run <laughs> the electric lines through the conduit that's already there, through the gas lines. How about that? And to this day, I've talked to uh, electricians who said, yeah, yeah, I was, I was doing an old, old house in San Francisco and the electric lines were run through old gas pipes. <laughs> and, but it was more than that. Ed Edison, Edison took no prisoners. Edison went further and said, he had a patented technique for running electric lines th through gas lines. And so he said, oh no, you have to run them through gas lines <laughs> because otherwise the rats will eat the insulation, which was mm -hmm. not true. But <laughs> anyway, okay. <laughs> so, so electrification replaces technologies running on fossil fuels. Okay, chanceification replaces calculations based on averages with those based on SIPs, stochastic information packets. They're, they're, they're like a set of Monte Carlo trials that blast through your model. And very important to distinguish between, we have both direct current and alternating current. The direct current is 10,000 Monte Carlo trials. The alternating current is more subtle. It is JSON code that delivers a little snippet of stuff to your machine, which then generates the Monte Carlo trials. The beauty of that is, and that's based on Tom Keelan's Metalog, the beauty of that is that based on Doug Hubbard's HDR generator, we could make them statistically independent or dependent or stuff like that. Okay, so let's discuss electrification for a sec. Um, so you got your light bulbs, you got your power plants and you got your transmission lines and that's about it and in the us at least we have these little three-pronged pluggies europe is a little more confused um 
And that confusion doesn't help that much because you've got to ca carry these little plug adapters everywhere. Um, so there's some difference. But, you know, in North America, 60 cycle AC current. Okay, so now let's go to chancification. I want to start with chance based decision making. What does that mean? I flip a coin and decide what to do. <laughs> okay. I've got my data scientists and my statisticians. I've got my IT personnel. And I'm just flipping a damn coin to decide what to do. How dumb is that? So if we connect these people together with the SIPMath standard, that decision maker can't say, oh, I don't know how long a meter is, so I'm just going to give you any amount of rope I feel is right. No. The data scientists and the IT people who get it to you say, no, this, this is the standardized risk for this kind of hack. Is it exactly right? No, but I mean, like, with horseshoes and hand grenades, close counts. Um, you, you at least have to address this one, right? You have to address what we're going to call the the email hack in the in the glass case in the museum in Paris. How, how do you deal with this one, right? Okay. Uh, uh, here, here's, here's the here's the business idea. Um, I, I think uh, any distribution at the confidence interval, 80 or 90% should be free, but anything above that confidence interval should be paid because it requires a lot more re precision and sophisticated modeling. And that absolutely could be the case. I mean, you, you, you know, Doug Hubbard would make a, a, an economic argument about the value of that additional precision, right? But look, yeah. so we go from chance-based decisions to chance-informed decisions and, and Alex, there is the little balance that you were talking about earlier. How about that? So it does show that we are on the same page. This was not premeditated, right? No. Well, we, we, we've only been talking about this for the last four years. But but we never said, said the risk reward thing yeah, exactly out true. loud. That's, it's just the way it true. works. Yeah, Two exactly. people who understand arithmetic are going to get incredibly similar answers when they add two to five yep. <laughs> without any collaboration. <laughs> they just go off and do it on their own. And of course, it is a trade-off, always a trade-off. And, and I, I think it is worth describing uh, the work of uh, of Harry Markowitz, for those who don't know, because it truly, truly, uh, I think launched launched everything. So you can stop sharing here while I try to bring up a, another mm -hmm. slide. Sorry. All right, now let me see what I can do here. Yeah. Um, um, Guys watching us, you send questions, comments. Andrew, thank you for your comments about the um, risk appetite framework. And uh, I agree. A lot of the risk management artifacts um, have proven to be just basically window dressing and not really affecting the actual decision making. Um, but I think to add to that, I think most of those artifacts were originally designed to be uh, window dressing. It, 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 they're, they're window dressing by design, not because people just didn't you know, oh, use them. Oh, wait a minute, wait, wait a minute. Not window dressing, they're smoke screens by design. Yes, yes. You take a look at the banking regulation. Yeah. Pages and pages of integrals and log normal distributions and, oh God. <laughs> You don't yeah, want to. Yeah, you you don't want to. You don't want to look at this stuff. You know, just trust us. Yeah, we're doing it fine. It, it's 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 even worse than non-financial. I remember Ministry of Finance um, issuing a guideline for taxation risk management, and they 
provided an actual formula for how you should be calculating uh, tax risk. And it was the most obscure, like fundamentally flawed formula you can think of. And but it it looked so impressive. But once you kind of once you look beyond the the beautiful pictures, you're going like, oh, this is insane. This is yeah. so wrong. Yeah, yeah. And see, so another feature that, that you need here, I, I'm going back to limbic analytics. The board member should be able to query the risk report and say, like, I'm sure with your tax formula there, if you adjusted revenues, you know, like, like it would go in the wrong direction or something. I mean, you, you, you need for people to trust the stuff. I mean, that's the <laughs> thing. They're not going to trust a smoke screen or some people will. Oh, yes, we believe this. So you get you get kind of like a um, a bifurcation. Uh, some people trust it, some don't, but some some don't trust it at all, and some overly trust it. So so it's that's a mess. But if it's an interactive model, and I have to remind everyone at Shell, and we, you know we we've talked about Shell in the past, but that was kind of the birth of this whole approach where people two steps below the CEO were clicking the mouse of an interactive program and they could tell if it was directionally correct. Okay. So, so let, let's go back now to 1952 and, uh, and, and Harry Markowitz, who actually was a student of my dad's and Harry helped us start the nonprofit. So, Harry Markowitz is a graduate student at the University of Chicago in economics. And he was asking, he was looking around for PhD topics and someone said, how about something on investments, how people make investments? And he looked up the academic literature at the time and it said, well, people invest to maximize their average returns. That makes sense, doesn't it? So for example, if I could, you know, invest um, $10 to get $12 back, I would do that. If I, but how about if I invest $10 in making a fake stick of dynamite and then I hijack a 747 and I ask for a billion dollars and I have one chance in a thousand of getting away with it. Oh my God, I get a million dollars back on average for my $10 investment. I'm hijacking the 747. No, I'm not. It's risky. Risk was not even observed. Just the average, flaw of averages all over the place. So mm -hmm. Harry said, Okay, guys. I'm adding a new dimension. So this, I'm going to call this uh, return. Or uh, here. Expected. Expected return on that axis. So, the 747 hijacking goes up there, it's at a million bucks. <laughs> okay, and then on this axis, um, on this axis, I've got risk for which he used Sigma squared, you just use the uncertainty. Okay. Now, you know, the theory of probability and statistics is powerful and elegant. And so is the steam locomotive. And they were developed at the same time. And sigma squared or variance is definitely steam era statistics. But it was the steam era. It was 1952. <laughs> Not only that, for very deep reasons that I don't want to get into now, variance made a lot of sense. Okay. 
And by the way, the expected value means the mean. So this is the mean return. Mean return. So this is known as the mean variance model. So now let's put some uh, some investments out here. Well, uh, I could leave my money in the in the mattress down there. No risk, no return. There could be a stock out here. And by the way, you, you, you could measure these things because you could go out and look at what the stock price was doing, right? Stock there, a stock here, a stock here, a stock here. Maybe some very wild and crazy thing up here. So in 1952, that might have been say, Xerox. So the, another idea that took a lot longer than the machine gun. Xerox, anyone know what a Xerox machine is anymore? They invented photocopying, for God's sakes. The patent is 1929. They didn't have their first operating machine until 1964. This is 1952. Xerox is like, you know, a nutcase. Could be huge, but okay. Anyway, so here are all the things you could invest in. And Harry looked at this and said, well, of course, why would you want any more risk than you can get for a given level of return? If we combine these correctly, and take advantage of the fact we not only have the variance, but we have the covariance matrix. So when some go up, others might go down, or at least not go up and down as much. The whole diversification effect. So what Harry showed and showed very elegantly mathematically was that for any desired level of return, and let here. So this is like a 5% return on your money, 10%, 15%. For any level of return, Harry showed mathematically how to minimize the risk. And virtually always, you would see, let's see, okay, virtually always, you're going to see that the, the stocks themselves, the individual stock, uh-oh, what happened to me? Oh, dear. <laughs> Um, it's all right. so, so, uh, okay. But the, so what happened was, uh, oh, there we go. Good. And I'm advancing the slide. What, what you see is that virtually always the stocks are not on the efficient frontier. Why? Because of diversification right like if i if i if i invest just in general motors i'm not as diversified as if i invest in general motors and ford yeah but i'm even better investing in like general motors and xerox or something okay so now the green line is known as the efficient frontier and what can you say 
about investments to the right of the efficient frontier, these investments are nuts. Look here, my favorite far side cartoon. Maybe I've shown it before. Here's a psychiatrist analyzing a patient. I don't know, maybe you want to stop sharing a second so we can see this. Here's the, here's the diagnosis of the patient. Just plain nuts. <laughs> I'm not sure that's, that's in the diagnostic, DRGs, the diagnostic, diagnostic related groups of, of, anyway, so you're nuts to be to the right of the efficient frontier and, and let's talk about Uh, what's up here? What investments do we have up here on the on the upper left? High return, low risk. No. Bernie Madoff and FTX. They don't exist. This is how they caught Bernie Madoff. You, it is just impossible to generate, okay, that much return without risk. Because Harry Markowitz already did the mathematical optimization to find out the safest way to invest. In a sense, look, how accurate is it? it? Accurate enough to catch Bernie Madoff, okay? And I'll bet you would have seen the same with FTX. So that's, so that's the basic notion of risk return trade-offs they appear everywhere this trade-off curve appears on our work with shell it appears every time i do anything more or less in this yeah. area but i think i think the, the very important point you're making is as we progress towards better uh, chance informed decision making every significant decision will become a trade-off between different options and there will be some sort of optimal set of options and then you know whichever one the decision makers end up choosing is basically just the subject of their uh, individual risk appetite yeah yes yes and the chance they are willing to take on something bad happening where they have to define that i think last time we looked at the consolidated risk statement, did we not? Where, where, One where, of the where, sessions, where, yes. Look, 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 wait a minute, wait a minute. Let's, let's give Doug Hubbard a plug here. This is something that I, I uh, okay, I'm gonna erase all the ink. Okay, so now I've got a different graph Uh, no, it's not. Well, it's not that different. Okay, so this is uh, bad outcomes. Oh, and just memorize that efficient frontier of Harry Markowitz, mm -hmm. just one second. Mm -hmm. Where do you want to invest on that frontier? Trick question. The answer is, it depends. It depends on your risk attitude. Anywhere, yeah. depending on your risk attitude. Put all the money in the mattress if you're a butt cover, put it all in whatever if you're you know, a risk taker. But for God's sakes, don't go to the right of the frontier because that's taking on more risk for a given level return. And don't go where Bernie Madoff is because, you know, he died in jail. <laughs> Doesn't exist. Okay. So now it's common in risk management to look at something called an exceedance curve. And so I'm mean, going to need two colors here. And so this red color, oh, so this, hold on, this, so this axis 
my favorite word chance so this is the chance that you get something this bad or less that's an exceedance curve so um so there's a very high chance you will get something of zero or less right and then it comes down and down and down and down and maybe it looks like that. And eventually you get over here and a very bad outcome on the right is we lose hundreds of millions of dollars, but there's an extremely small chance of that. And so-, so Kushal is asking a question, yeah. which I know you already answered, um, but I think it's just, it's, it's worth reiterating quickly. What's the difference oh, oh, yeah, between yeah, 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 yeah. Wait a and risk and fault? No, 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 no. Here's the difference. Risk is not a well-defined word. Chance is. So risk, you, whatever you were thinking of as risk-aware decision-making, if risk were a well-defined word, that would be well-defined. But it's not. Whose risk are you talking about? Right. Mm -hmm. So risk is in the eye of the beholder. That's the only problem with the word risk. Chance could be in the eye of the beholder too, but 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 it's not loaded. It isn't. It, it has nothing to do here. Chance has nothing to do with your preference, right? Mm -hmm. Risk always has to do with your preference. I'm rolling dice and I've bet on eight. Well, then my preference is that eight comes up. But the chance that has nothing to do with the chance of eight coming up. So, yeah. so this curve, this re, this red curve, is risk risk exceedance the chance that the risk will be this bad or worse. Okay. And again, this is something I first saw with Doug Hubbard. Um, now, here comes your risk preference. So, looks like this. I mean, you know, imagine it looked like that. So this is And when I use the word risk in this in this context the board of directors has gotten together and said this is financial risk in in we are the beholders we are going to come up with a consensus of how we feel about this may not even be easy to do but we will do it and we're going to write this down and say this is how this company feels about risk this is going to be the the basis on which we make chance informed decisions based on this set of preferences. So what we have here now is the fact, actually here. So in this region here, The risk the organization incurs, the red line, is greater than the risk we can tolerate. Mm -hmm. And we say, well, that's where we have to apply our risk management. Right? That if it gets worse than that, that's already built into shareholder expectations. Right? If it's less than that, it's already built into shareholder expectations. But wow, here's something we hadn't thought of. So the $100 million loss, eh, we're all dead anyway. <laughs> the, the, the $8 million losses were covered by insurance. But oh my gosh, there's this region in the middle 
where we haven't thought it through and suddenly we've got this risk exposure, but just for this kind of part of the curve. Yep. And I have, I have, an, I have an amazing case on that. Um, one of the uh, business owners, I think head of logistics, uh, reached out to my team saying, oh, we need to insure, you know, rail cars. And so we've done the calculation. What's the kind of what's the risk exposure that we're sitting on if we insure or don't insure? And it turns out if we do nothing, if we don't insure the, the rail cars, the the exposure that we're sitting on was below the shareholders' risk appetite or this you know this risk uh, preference curve. And, and so we go back saying it makes no sense spending money on that risk because it was. Uh, within the acceptable limits for the shareholder. He already informed us that he was okay carrying on that risk. Yes. Okay. I now have to run. <laughs> I've run into another meeting, but it's always so fun, Alex. And uh, thanks, Sam. See you next time. Goodbye. See you next time. Thanks. All right. I um I'll I'll stay around for a couple of minutes. Any questions? Any uh, any topics you would like to propose for the following uh, following week's webcast? We usually do them once a week, uh, and we call them chance talk. By the way, if you want to see some of the case studies and examples that we discussed uh, in the previous weeks, and we've been doing this for at least uh, ten or fifteen weeks now, um, you can find them on the Risk Academy YouTube channel. There's a whole playlist called Chance Talk and it has every workshop um, that we did with time codes so you can uh, I, th I think i think i've done time codes for all of them now so you can kind of see which topics we discussed when and you know, what topics are included in each in each session so i've upgraded uh, i've upgraded the videos a bit um any thoughts comments questions uh write them here and uh, we will address them in the next week's episode Thank you, everyone, and goodbye.